Um, thanks for joining in. Uh, this is our first of our talks this year. Uh, we have Cameron Finney on the seat from Engine Architecture, uh, who's going to be sharing his experiences in architecture, uh, justice career, etc. So Cameron is born and bred in Devon and studied at UK then, graduated um, his master's with cum laude. In 2024, started uh, PSET Devon. And then um, he's, he's been having his practice uh, running for the past um, six years. Actually, it actually feel, doesn't feel that much long, uh, Cameron, when you were, I mean, a DJ just recently. It um, feels like yesterday. Yeah, six years has <laughs> gone past so quickly. So although um, his practice is based in, in Devon, he collaborates a lot with uh, people outside like uh, UK and other countries. So Cameron, over to you, man. Cool, thanks, Gora. Let me just share my screen. Okay. So yeah, morning, everybody. Thanks for joining in. Um, I was saying to Skura, you must be really scraping the barrel um, when you asked me to speak, but I am very thankful uh, for the welcome. for the opportunity to share. <laughs> um, yeah, just I wanted to just um, start by saying um, I just wanted to share my heartfelt condolences to the family and friends of Paul um, Paul Wagas' tragic loss to our society. Um, so love, peace, and light to Colleen and, and all of those close to him. Um, so yeah, um, I just, I'm just i going to go through a bit of a background um, from, from my side. So I started thinking a little bit more about where I'm at as an architect at the moment and started thinking deeper about where ideas and things have come from. And I think for as long as I can remember, I've always had a relationship with old or discarded forgotten things um, my late uncle was a scrap dealer a rat with a gold tooth as he always called himself um, he really was the epitome of the saying one man's trash was another man's treasure he was a hoarder um, but he always had what he needed including old pinball machines he somehow managed to resurrect so i think between him and my dad um, they taught me about treasuring what we have um, being creative with things that we have and, and keeping them alive, repair, the idea of repairing rather than replacing and, and using your own hands to do it. Um, for some reason, it just feels like all bullies are able to fix motors and cars and things and, and our generation haven't got a clue how to open the bonnet. Um, but um, yeah, I didn't really think much of this um, until I started studying architecture. I feel very privileged when I look back and, and think about the undergrad I had um, with lecturers like Derek Van Heerden, Rodney Harbour, Derek Rang, uh, Derek Wang, Prof Peters, Kevin Bingham, Dung, Lindsay, CD, Leon, all through the undergrad process. It was a wild couple of years, but it was awesome. Um, we learned a lot about space and place, relevance, critical regionalism, local materials, construction, grassroots, sustainability, and of course, the greats, Corb, Mies, Niemeyer, to name a couple. I never forget our first lecture though with um, Derek Wang. It's, it's always stuck with me. He said, architecture is like making love. If you're not doing it, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. And that's always stuck with me. Um, and I think uh, I remember chatting to Derek Van Heerden about um, the lectures with Derek Wang. And he said, if you can pick up five percent of what's going on in those lectures you're doing well um i'm sure a lot of you've been around um professor wang he was on another level but a, a key idea that i learned quite early on um in undergrad was north is god and i think that was a um an idea passed down from Bar barry Beerman through the years um i remember students almost failing if their buildings didn't face north in undergrad um, and it was a it was a core memory that and also just being introduced of the idea of uh, handmade architecture or 
a recycled architecture. So not just recycling in terms of waste and power, but um, building materials and buildings as a whole. So the old things that were worth protecting because of their intrinsic value and history and story um, were worth keeping. So I think that was my first introduction into the idea of adaptive reuse architecture. After, um, after completing my undergrad, uh, I somehow managed to convince Design Workshop to employ me. Um, there I learned about how these principles could be applied in the real world. The office was the hive of creative activity, architecture, music, handcraft, materials, models, design, beauty, more adaptive reuse, and, and obviously good times. Um, but the conversations always came back to the importance of place. So armed with these ideas, it felt like every project was explored with care and finesse. Um, what I didn't realize though, when I was working at Design Workshop, um, that I'd be working on that grand old dame in the back of the picture, that white building on the left-hand side, some 14 years later, it makes me feel very old. Um, but I also fondly remember it was a kind of office principle at the time that if somebody traveled, they'd have to come back and do a presentation about where they've been. And I remember seeing um, firsthand experiences of what Tate Modern and uh, in London, that designed by Herzog and Amiron, and um, Casa de Musica in Porto. Um, Janina, I think you're on the call. I think it was you who went to Casa de Musica with Andrew. And I just remember being completely awestruck um, by these buildings. And I knew I needed to go and see more of the world. So I headed off to um, London, set myself up there, specifically avoided all the South African hangouts um, and spent two years uh, walking the place flat and traveling as much as I could afford. Um, I love the South Bank. I pretty much lived there every weekend walking, um, visited the Tate Modern too many times to count. And to me, probably one of the best pieces of modern architecture that I've experienced. Um, the Turbine Hall, that's the shot on the left hand side, is still something to behold. I was there in September last year and it's still mind blowing. Um, and then obviously in the middle is um, Casa de Musica, designed by Rem Koolhaas. I managed to sneak my way in and have a look around again. Unbelievable piece of architecture. Um, and the other on the right hand side, that, uh, that was another favorite of mine that was frequented regularly. It was a nightclub called Coco in Camden, which was obviously an old theater that had been um, converted into a, a nightclub. Somehow, while I was there, my, my path crossed with an established South African architect, um, Brendan Garrity. I, I wonder how many of you guys remember or know of that name. Um, I worked with GTA, um, Garrity Taylor Architects, for a while. And it was so different coming from a South African perspective, being constrained so much. We, we, we kind of moan quite a lot here about the constraints that we're put under, but in terms of regulations and constraints in the UK, it's, it's unreal. Um, there's so much red tape regulations and it felt like often the building was already modeled in three dimensions just purely because of the regulations. So, um, I mean, they had, they, there was a regulation um, called right of light. You couldn't take somebody's right of light away. I mean, can you imagine if we had that in this country? Um, so often all you had to do or you could play with was um, proportion and small details. And obviously with residential developments, um, every square inch needed to be counted for. So that was a real lesson in, in um, restraint and constraint. There, while I was in the UK, I uh, met the love of my life, Jess. I think some of you have met her before. She's an interior designer. Um, she was wanting to leave the hustle and bustle of London. So as most South Africans do, I sold her the dream of living in Durban where lollipop sticks grow into banana trees and wild animals roam the streets. Um, she bought it and we moved back to Durban. Um, she too, at the time I had a love for transformation and adaption, um, obviously in the form of spaces and furniture. And she wanted to continue that in South Africa. Now to, to think about it, I think I was just another project of hers. 
Um, so we came back to Durban. She continued her own business. Um, I dove headfirst into masters with new ideas, obviously desperate to be applied in a more local context. Um, I used these years as a bit of an experiment, having fun with design. Um, and my dissertation was a proposal for a skills development center um, in, in Durban. I, you might recognize the old beer hall on the right hand side. Um, a timber clad building had a hollowed out core down the middle, down into a courtyard with the beer halls, um, old existing trusses um, exposed. And I'll just go back the shape, I think, um, to try and, again, connect with the history of the building. Um, the shape of that front facade uh, was folded down and recast on the front to create a kind of front stoop for art activations and things. But um, it felt to me, I, I was starting to branch into a kind of more honest tectonic kind of architecture inspired by um, Herzog and Demir on adaptive use projects that I'd seen overseas. Once I'd finished um, my postgrad, um, I joined the team at Dean J Architects, where I worked alongside some amazing people. Um, I like to th think Dean was impressed with my thesis, um, and that's why he threw me head first, uh, well, more in the deep end in running um, the line match project, which I think in total there was about nine buildings um yeah it was a it was an absolute hockey stick learning curve uh, but very grateful for it. lots of lessons learned um it also helped that i believed in the mission of what dean was trying to achieve the drive to convert these old factories and warehouses and the the main idea was about that it was being sustainable reusing as much of what we could in terms of the buildings and the building fabric um, reusing windows and doors and pulley systems and things as wherever we could. Um, but yeah, we, we had a lot of fun in those projects, crawling around in some of the underground tunnels. I'm sure if Mark Bellingen and Oswell are on the call, they'll remember some funny memories of crawling around in there. Um, what I realized working at Dean's was how hard it is to deal with old buildings in a sympathetic way while keeping developers and clients who are often not that interested in all of the things that we are, how do you keep that balance? It's really, really tricky. Um, I definitely gained a new respect for architects and how tough it is to do good architecture, particularly in this country. Um, after four and a half years, I was at Dean's. Um, I decided to branch out on my own. Um, my son was about three months at the time, and really I just wanted to spend some more time with him, or as much time as possible. So that was the beginning of my business, um, Engine Architecture, 2016. And what a better way to kickstart a new practice than mess about with your own home. So Jess and I had quite recently bought a flat. We loved it for all the reasons that pe most people ignored it. It was old. It hadn't been modernized and it smelt like old people. Um, but again, it had old, it had the old um, feel to it. It had great bones, high ceilings, timber floors, beautiful old timber windows. And we were quite keen to make it suit us better. So naturally, before we had even properly bought the place, we had started knocking walls down. Um, and yeah, we, we spend quite a lot of energy in, in transforming the house um, or the flat into something that we quite enjoy. That's my son on the left hand side asleep under the kitchen counter. Um, another one of the early projects of mine, it felt like obviously when you're starting your own business, it feels like all you're doing is alterations for the first, I think it's about 10 years you're doing alterations. Um, but this was a proposal renovating an old art house on the left hand side into a two bedroom ancillary unit. So only 80 square meters. Um, sadly, my client got cold feet and didn't actually end up building this thing. Um, I'm still wondering if it was the Gabian wall that he didn't like and didn't want to be honest with me. Um, another project I worked on quite early on was a property down in Amshloti and this was under um, common architecture. You can see Mark in the front here next to the builder. Um, it was a simple brief, that's the existing on the left hand side, was the brief was 
make it better, um, which I hope the original architect's not on this call. Um, but yes, so we, we moved the, the front stair to the back of the property. We opened up the bedrooms um, onto the verandas at the front and obviously edited the house as much as possible. Um, we're very happy with how this turned out. It was a really good project, um, as, with the, uh, as was the client. But I mean, to be honest, you could literally do anything to the building on the left to have made an improvement on it. Um, at the time, Jess was doing quite a bit of work with Propertuity. Um, you guys probably remember they, they were here um, 2017, 2018. Um, and it felt like they were really making an effort in Durban. And it's quite sad if you drive through these areas now, it feels like the, the areas have degraded quite a lot since they were involved. Um, I remember chatting to Jonathan Liebman um, saying that he thought the city would bring out a red carpet and instead they brought out the red tape. Um, but that's probably another, another debate for another time. Um, this was one of the proposals, um, quite conceptual uh, conversion of the old Pan Am building in town that was designed by Dean many, many years ago. Um, not in great nick at the time. Um, Propertuity wanted essentially a for the lack of a better word, a full makeover of the of the building, including a roof terrace um, and, and separate entrances and things. Um, but sadly, didn't persuade the tenant to move in and they found other premises. I think they did end up doing a little bit of work here, but not not as extravagant as we were proposing. Um, and then in 2017, I got a call from a friend of mine who said his buddy had been uh, crawling around up in his roof space and went to grab a rafter and put his hand right through the truss and nearly fell through the ceiling below. Um, obviously, Bora just trashed the roof and um, wanted to know if I was able to help the guy. So I went to meet him. Um, you can see the house on the left-hand side. That's the existing property. And you could tell straight away that the property had obviously been, because of where it was in Durban North, it had obviously been added to over the years. Um, it wasn't the simple little two bedroom box plan as it probably would have been um, back in the thirties. But we had a good look around the house and could tell again, bones. There was something, some, there was a sense about the, about the property that there was something else to it. Um, and it turned out that it was actually my client's granddad who built the property back in the 1930s. And this was on the old site of um, the old dairy farm in Durban North. So even though the house was much larger than the original, we the, the renovations that ultimately made the house disjointed, disconnected from the outside. And the worst part of it was that it was dark inside. Even through the day, lights had to be on all the time. My client also, I recall in one of our early meetings, they were always looking forward to the weekends when they could leave. and it um, yeah, it was quite quite sad to think that they've bought this house and they they're looking forward to leaving um, more than they are staying. So I explained that obviously if we were going to redo the roof, it meant that all the walls that previously held it up were now up for grabs. So it was an opportunity to regain order and open up the house. Living areas could be more defined and connected again to the outside, which it never was before. Um, one thing was clear that the house needed light. So we kind of used that as a main principle or concept um, and referencing the old dairy um, or the, the old dairy archetype, the modern barn concept was formed. So the existing roof was removed in its entirety um, and we redesigned it to create two defined bays, living in bedrooms linked by a simple passage down the middle, which was a flat concrete slab. And um, we used as much as the old buildings as we could, including building material. So majority of the bricks that were that came out were the old beautiful um, coronation bricks we reused. Um, yeah, and we reintroduced um, light into the house so that some of the shots on the right hand side were kind of right in the middle of the home. Um, we introduced polycarb and timber slats underneath just to bring a kind of dappled light into the house, into the darker areas. Um, 
I think for me, the, the most interesting thing about this property was we, we used every inch of the house and we ended up converting a three bedroom house into a four bedroom house by only adding three square meters. So you can tell it was already big enough to handle it, but it was just, it needed some um, rejigging of the plan. So the client was delighted for, for the renovation to include an extra bedroom. Um, so yeah, thankfully my client loved the house and they've actually brought the property next door and we've been tasked with doing the same thing. So this is their neighbor, neighboring property, um, much more of a mess than, um, than theirs to begin with. Um, again, it was a simple two bedroom box plan house and it had been added and added to over the years. Um, we actually ended up deciding to make the house smaller. Um, we removed that roof room up at the top, rejigged the plan to get it to work better. So when we submitted to council, we were actually submitting negative proposed FAR, which was a nightmare. I would never suggest that to do that again. We should have just said zero. Um, would have been far easier. Uh, they, they just couldn't wrap their head around the fact that somebody was building less. It didn't make any sense. Um, but the client's brief, again, was simple. We want it to be exactly the same house as ours. <laughs> so I feel, I feel like we've made it work. Um, there's some unique bits. Um, and obviously, we've referenced as much as we could on their place. And again, two simple defined bays, um, living in bedrooms separated by a concrete passage. Um, it was a bit of a trick to get these roofs to work in a similar way. Um, the main difference on the property was that the garage is at the front uh, rather than the back. So this shot bottom left shows their, their house and obviously the, the new property um, on the left. So they had a long driveway all the way to the back where the garages were, whereas the other properties got the garages right at the front, which meant they've got a huge garden at the back. Um, but yeah, so we, we needed to try and get them up as quickly as possible. Um, so we needed to introduce a stair, which they didn't have in their property. But it was also an opportunity to create quite a strong defining element as the entrance to the house. It also screened off the entertainment areas you can see from here, from their pool right across. It was quite open, so they were they're looking at renting this property out. So we wanted to screen this off. So it was a good opportunity to do something quite strong here. Um, we reused the same polycarb and timber detail that we explored at their place, but instead of just doing it in parts, I've managed to convince them to do the full southern wing of the living room. So this whole south section is, is this polycarb. I've said to them they need, they're going to need sunglasses on um, inside. So this one is still under construction. This is what it looks like at the moment. Um, we're making headway, working with a fantastic builder. Um, yeah, so it, it all at the moment is all going smoothly, but we'll see. Um, at the moment, I'm trying to convince my client to move into this property and rent theirs out, but we'll see. Um, another project uh, I've been working on with Jess recently. Um, we were approached by uh, Paul Krauss at RTI. Um, that's the, the old white dame I was talking about earlier, top left, um, that uh, Design Workshop worked on back in 2002, I think. Um, they did the original refurb of the house. So again, the property had good bones, which is so much easier to come into. Um, we also had a really good client. They really let us run with it. And the only specific request was that they wanted Zoom rooms, which is now obviously a new room typology, I suppose a hangover from the pandemic. But um, we're obviously very aware of trying to keep harmony between the old and new, as well as not trashing the good work that Design Workshop did back um, in the early 2000s. Um, so for example, we referenced the old boardrooms and, and put paneled walls in the new boardrooms. We've tried to keep as much of the existing truss uh, structure, the open trusses in the little Zoom room area. So these feel like little cathedrals or maybe not as grand, but maybe churches. They've got a, a really beautiful open truss um, but yeah, we, we thoroughly enjoyed that project and Jess and I have been working closer and closer together, which has been lots of fun. Um, 
but along the way I've been developing my own internal processes and kind of like co-tangers or concepts, I suppose, that I come back to all the time. These are, these are things, building blocks that I'm, I'm revisiting and, and trying to get deeper into with every project. And um, I share these with my clients um, before we start, most of which are kind of self-explanatory. So the first is North is God, follow the sun, follow the light, breakfast in the east, cocktails in the west. Clients don't quite understand the importance of this. And I, I think we can all agree that if this is something that is not positioned very, very early on, um, we lose track of it. And then we ended up with, you end up with cold south facing rooms. Um, yeah, so that that's a, a principle I like to follow. That's obviously from Barry Bierman slash Professor Wang. Um, the idea of um, place and respectful place. So to paraphrase Kenneth Frampton's critical regionalism, to respond to the peculiarities of a particular place or a site. So identifying place and replying to it directly or responding it responding to it directly and letting architecture and materials speak from where they came. And the, the last point on that was protecting heritage worth saving. So things that are worth keeping and worth preserving to try and save. The idea of honesty in architecture, materials, people, a celebration of the built form through the display of how things are put together, the tectonics, exhibit the tectonics of the building. Um, sustainable, I know this term gets thrown around quite a lot, um, but I think for me, it's more of a, the idea of reusing reusing building materials, reusing buildings, low impact, passive climate control as much as possible. And the idea of responsible decision making creates responsible architecture. And the last one, which is a little bit more difficult to um, describe, but it is the idea of soul. And it's defined as an immaterial force within one which life energy and power is thought to be given all the qualities or qualities that make a thing what it is. So it's perhaps a sense of history or, or something that was or no longer is, but the essence is still present. Um, I find sometimes too often soul is in, in architecture is often overlooked and, and you get distracted by the pretty pictures and the, the sexy renders, but there's a lack of soul. So it's something that I'm trying to drive into the design um, you know have led you you'll know it when you walk into a building and you feel something you can't quite put your finger on it but you can feel it and it makes you feel good it's that impact um but yeah uh, that's Cameron Cameron uh, what, Skura? well yeah one one thing I'd like to with what you just said now uh the the previous slides is, is on, the, on on heritage uh that um what what can be saved so in other words we uh, protect heritage uh, protect heritage worth saving so it's, it's something that uh, it's, uh, that that opens up a debate i mean we're talking about the terminal building at the moment so um it's, it's, it's important for architects to know that uh, in looking at heritage is something that must 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 be debated must be a, a study it must it must be something that's 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 of value beyond, uh, I guess, uh, our elitist view, so to speak. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> it's, mm. it's yeah. I mean, you driving around Durban over the last 10, 15 years, you can see it's happening all over the place. Development on a on a large scale. Um, I suppose that's why I loved working um, on Line Match because again, that could have been quite easily destroyed and rebuilt, it probably would have been cheaper to demolish half of those buildings and rebuild some very simple office blocks, but they would have lacked soul. And I think that right. that's a, a huge part for me is that there's there's soul to it, there's history, there's story. And so often new, new architecture, modern architecture lacks that sense of soul. And I think, I mean, yeah, talking about the, the terminal buildings and that, have you seen what has been proposed there? It's the antithesis of what I've been talking about here. It's, That's it's, correct. That's it's, correct. Yeah. It's not positive. I think maybe economic 
I think that's the whole drive for it, but there's got to be another way. And um, yeah, it's, it's shocking. Funny enough another on that one, uh, the, a senior official the transport I spoke to says the, 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 the case does not make sense financially still by Transnet. They, they are not convincing that it's actually going to be a good economic uh, move anyway. So it actually that is something that we need to fight. Well, then what is the point of doing it if it isn't going to be economic? I thought that was the whole argument for doing it, that it was an economic no, the thing and it was progress and future. Lining up yet, yeah. Jeez, I mean, then they literally have no legs to stand on. But yeah, yeah I, anyway, I don't know. Yeah. Sorry can, to come um, in there, yeah. No, no, no. Thanks. I'm glad to hear somebody's still there. It's very strange speaking to myself here. Um, <laughs> we'll keep quiet when the presentation is enthralling. <laughs> I was I actually, I spoke to a few buddies of mine. I said, can you just come and sit in the room with me and like say, ooh and ah at the right places and laugh. Um, but yeah, nobody was very interested, no, but, um, <laughs> um, yeah. So these, these principles, I don't believe I've, matched or hit yet they are um their goals their aims so the idea is i'm aiming towards these things and the, the goal posts as they always do shift when you reach certain parts so it feels like staying the course aiming up and that that's essentially what i'm doing so that's what we do as engine architecture at the moment um i don't know if you wanted to stop there square because i that's essentially it from my side in terms of me and my business um we're then mm -hmm. going to move on to beset give you a kind of quick introduction um, no that's no fine i, I think you can just time. run through okay. the whole thing i think when when we discuss we we'll, we'll discuss uh, uh everything okay it's yeah, so okay cool okay so um beset durban i'm um I'm going to pretend like a lot of you don't know who, what this is, but I know there's quite a few of you that have already spoken and, and been part of this. Um, I'll call it a movement. It's not my favorite word, but it's a movement um, for optimistic urbanism. Um, so we, I, I've always felt frustrated from with people growing up in Durban, always saying that there's nothing to do here. And there's, everybody wants to go off to, Cape Town and Joburg and um, it felt like the real core people who love Durban are the ones that end up staying. And um, I realized quite quickly, I wasn't the only one who felt this frustration. Um, so two friends and I decided to start something and see where it goes. It was very much off the cuff. Let's see what happens. And the idea was we wanted to see if people were as interested in Durban as we were. Um, it was a simple question. So armed with one iPhone between the three of us, we launched Beset Durban. And the idea was that we were going to take people out of their comfort zone and take them into places that they may not have experienced um, otherwise. So we had a few ground rules, though, before we started. Um, it will be open to everyone. Our expenses, our experiences are for anyone who wants to join us. If you hear about it and sign up in time, you can come and be part of the movement. So often we would give people in the early days, we'd give them about a week or so in terms of um, lead times. Towards the end, we were it, it, it became too much for us to handle. And we were in, we ended up only giving people 48 hours notice um, of where we were starting and what we were talking about. Um, We'll be on the ground so we'll, we were out in the world sharing an authentic experience of the city with a group of like-minded people you'll learn something that was a key part of what we wanted to do so we turned everyday experts into compelling storytellers giving insight to the story behind the places you may have never found yourself or in otherwise and the other one, which was quite controversial in the, in the um, later stages, was that it'll only happen once. So we'll never repeat an experience exactly. And to get that specific experience, you had to be there. Um, so the, the premise was simple. Connect an expert with the public, stand back and watch. So the first walk um, we did, we pulled in 
people that we knew for favors. So this was a walk we decided to do exploring the um, Crofton and Benjamin buildings along the beachfront. We had Leon involved, Leon Conradi, who's a bit of an expert when it comes to Crofton and Benjamin. And we sent this out to our friends and family, and we literally thought there'd be maybe 10 people rock up. And we turned up on the day, it was pouring with rain, and we had about 40 people that joined us, and it was awesome. We, we started at Las Vegas, and we caught the people mover. It was awesome. And again, we met people on that day that we'd never, we didn't even know were in Durban. We don't even know how they actually found us. So we thought, okay, cool, we've got something going here. So we started creating these little maps. Um, you can see this is back in 2013. Um, Glenwood Coffee Walk, we gave people an idea of where we were going to be going to. Again, another 40, 50 people rocked up. We couldn't believe it. So we carried on. Point Archie Walk um, down on the point, 2014 now. Again, very simple map, just giving an idea of where we were going to be heading to. And the group just started growing and growing and growing. I mean, for the three of us, we were, <laughs> we were absolutely panicked by the fact that we had to, it was like herding stray cats. I mean, we hardly really got a chance to engage with the speakers, but it was mostly just us making sure nobody was going to get run over. Um, so it, it grew very, very quickly. Um, we then had another walk uh, planned out in Rivertown. Um, again, the old beer hall. We had um, Rodney Koromansky spoke um, and Andrew Macon, and it was unbelievable. We had, I think it was over 350 people turned up. So um, yes, <laughs> it was very, very scary in the morning, seeing more and more people rocking up yeah. to this thing. We were, we were really thinking back now, we were absolutely winging this thing. We had no real, we had an idea of a route. We had an idea of a couple of questions we would ask, like leading questions to the speakers. Um, but other than that, it was very much out of our hands. Um, so after we did this walk, we then, we then got in touch with, um, well, actually the New York Times got in touch with us. Um, and about three months later, National Geographic, a traveler got in touch with us. And we did a couple of walks and things with these guys was unreal. I mean, again, this was within, I think about eight months of us, or maybe six months of us starting. Um, we were featured in the New York Times, featured in the National Geographic. Um, we, we often joke that it was gonna be Beset Durban, Beset Space. We were like starting to take over. Um, we, yeah, we ended up meeting um, David Rocco, who's a world famous, um, chef and we did a whole episode with him in in durban jonas um Baruch joined us uh, at about this time thankfully because he's an absolute machine and you kind of just he's got a wind up clock on his back and you can just wind him up and he goes um and he's really Cameron, good in front of the camera. this was really great because i mean the new york times uh, listed the walks as one of the uh, uh sort things to do when you come to Devon. Yeah. That's Most right. key things to do when you come to Devon. That's that was really great. Yeah, we we were obviously we were completely blown away. We had no idea that this was gonna end up like this. Um so yeah, it was it was awesome. And National Geographic did a whole feature of us in their traveler magazine. Um it was about 10 page spread of a whole walk and everything we said to them they they recorded. Um yeah and again we were seriously flying by the seat of our pants at this time. I mean, literally, it was within the first couple of months of us starting. So we had, I think we hadn't, we definitely hadn't been approached by local press. The first time we'd, we were contacted by anybody was the New York Times, which just shows how asleep some of the um, local guys were. It was, I, yeah, I can't even remember how it actually all panned out. But then all of a sudden, we got the newspapers, the local guys started um, publishing us and finding um, yeah, walks to join us on and that. Um, so yeah, it really was a bit of an explosion for us um, through these years. So yeah, we just, we carried on. The walks got more interesting. Um, we ended up, a, uh, we needed a speaker because people couldn't hear. Obviously when you're 10 rows deep, you can't hear someone speaking without a, um, a microphone. So. Again, we, we had an emailing list. I think we had about 8,000 people on our emailing list at the time. 
we sent out an email saying, guys, look, we're not generating any money from this. Um, the walks are free at up until this point they were. And we just said, look, as, if anybody can donate, please, we're looking for something. I think it was about 18,000 Rand or something like something serious and proper we wanted to do. We raised the money in 45 minutes. Um, it was again, insane. We couldn't believe it. So we were, we were able to secure a new speaker system, which meant that we could continue doing the walks and people weren't sort of saying, I can't hear what anybody's saying. Um, yeah, so this was, this was a walk we did down, um, on the promenade. We had professional surfers tell us about their history of, um, new pier. We had engineers telling us about how all the dredging happened in the, in the harbor. So the, the speakers were very, or have always been very wide ranging. There's no specifics. If it was a case of, if you knew a lot about a particular subject and you were keen to talk about it, you're in. So that was one of the walks we did down on the beachfront. Um, there's Leon again. We've, we've lent on Leon quite a few times over the years. Um, that's at the city hall. Uh, that is in um, Ambassador House. That was with Poison City when they were launching, if you guys recall their beer, um, they were launching their beers and we got in touch with them. They told us all about how they were keeping it all Durban and they were, I mean, very much Durban born and bred um, and their whole branding and everything. It was really interesting hearing about it and the process of how you make beer and all of that. Um, obviously, when we said to people, there's free beer, this was one, one of the biggest walks we had in Durban. Um, yeah, so we, we started in 2014 properly. That one in 2013 was, was the first walk we did. Um, and since then, we've done about 50 walks unrepeated, varying topics, varying people. 90% um, of our walks have been free. Um, the only walks we've done that have had a small cost to it have been our secret walks, which is zero information um we we would launch it maybe a week before so maybe on the monday we'd say there's a secret walk it's usually around 100 bucks um first come first serve filling up to 40 50 people it's often required smaller numbers of people and then all we would do is send a pin where we were starting and give no further information and again those secret walks fill up within 30 minutes to an hour it's full so people have over the years, they've trusted us that we're going to do something interesting. Um, I mean, one year we we did a tour to Buffalo's Dry um, landfill site. We got a bus. Um, the city sponsored a bus for us, and we cruised all the way out there and and did a whole walk through the the landfill site, which was absolutely incredible. Um, but yeah, that was that was awesome. I think that was actually one of our first secret walks we did. Um, yeah, and then obviously through COVID and everything, we, we had to shut everything down. I mean, we were averaging around 250 people on a walk. Um, and obviously with that just becomes um, logistics of, you know, crossing the road is now it takes you five, 10 minutes to get 200 people across the road. And we often got stopped by the police thinking we were in a legal protest. And we had a couple of um, walks where the police actually just ended up joining the walk and they kind of chaperoned us around um, the city. Yeah, so I think just to sort of close, our experiences were open to everyone, no two are the same, and to understand it fully, you had to be there. Um, ultimately, we wanted to connect individuals with their cities, share the stories of people who lived there, and make people proud of the places again, one experience at the time. We, we very much believed in the idea of an ambassadorship. So there was so much negativity at the time about Durban. We, we really wanted to try and promote Durban as a positive place online, social media, et cetera. And it worked. I mean, I think we've got about 15,000 photographs that have been tagged beset Durban on, on Instagram and they're all unbelievable photographs and experiences in Durban. So we, we really wanted to try and change the perception, um, one walk at a time. Um, yeah, and then in, in 2016, we created Beset Run, and we're now doing three weekly runs, um, rain or shine, um, two on Monday, one on Wednesday, and that's been awesome. Um, 
we kind of started that selfishly because we wanted to start running and we knew if we put it under the Bassett Durban umbrella, we wouldn't let it down. We'd let each other down, friends, but we weren't going to let the brand down because we've all worked so hard on it and it, and it worked. The, the principles worked. We now, I mean, yeah, you can see that's the kind of squad of people that join us um, down on the, on the promenade. We've collaborated with Under Armour. Um, when we started Bassett Run um, a couple of years down the track, we, we did some um, collaborative runs with them, which was really cool. Uh, we've now branched out to doing some branded t-shirts and things. So if you're interested, please contact us. Um, yeah, and if you've got an idea, we, we really want to try and get back into this again. But like I said, through COVID and that, it, it kind of went a bit quiet. But if you've got an idea for a walk and you've, you're have desperate to get something off your chest, please drop me a line. That's the email address. Let's walk at besetdurban.com. Um, but yeah, I think we as humans, we want to feel part of something. So it, it, it's in our nature of being. We want to feel part of something. So we feel like being connected to something specific to where we live can help ground us also. So we feel like Beset has been quite a nice vehicle for that connection. Um, yeah. So thanks. Thanks, Skura. That's all I have to say. Thanks for joining me this morning, everybody. Um, I really appreciate the time. Your time, I know it's valuable. So thank you for listening to me waffle on for an hour. <laughs> Thank you so much, bro. Um, cool. That was that was absolutely amazing. Um, I think what Beset is doing in uh, in terms of us believing and valuing uh, our city has been absolutely amazing. Kept looking for myself in the pictures, not there. <laughs> But I was there somewhere. You were, you were there. You make sure <laughs> Sorry, that I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to pedal a propaganda that Skura doesn't come with us. Let me look for those pictures. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were there. Well, you can speak at the next one, man. We must talk about it. I'd, I'd love to. We'd love to do some more of it. It's just, yeah. yeah. I think all of us have been um, preoccupied, obviously, businesses yes. and children and all sorts. We were footloose and fancy free back in 2013, like. Mm. no home loans and and you know yeah. massive responsibilities and things have changed but i mean we'd we'd love to continue doing it so um yeah anyway, no, thank you amazing. for the kind words I, I, yeah, thank, much you. thank you so much and uh, uh it, 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 in your architectural work um uh, just thinking about your your the the time that you were at, at, at dinj made me think of all the senior architects we have on the log whether it's lecturers, mentors, or people we've worked under, uh, just to take a moment to appreciate them. Uh, in your case, it's Dean Jay, look at uh, Mark Bellingham as well now, he's got his own practice working with uh, Mark Oswell, and a lot of other people were in that practice. Uh, so uh, kudos to all the mentors and senior architects uh, who, have, uh, who have helped us along the way. Um, Cameron, I want to find out the the the, the house that the, those houses with the, the the long strip houses that you do the ceiling in um, the texture and everything inside. Uh, have you actually thought of entering that for awards, or or have you done that before? I haven't. Um, I think the the first house that was complete was. Um, I think it was in between years. I'm hoping to still be able to enter that one. I may need to just chip over the date. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, because but, I think um, it's such a, they're still painting. Such a lovely example of, 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 of taking, uh, uh, reusing a building, but uh, uh, focusing on textures and, and how the interior is finished. And I, I would really love to actually go inside those, but I, I think it's the, there's so much effort that's been put in those. Uh, so well done in that. Uh, as a reluctant uh, house architect myself, uh, I, I mean, how much time does it take you on site to do those? Um, well, obviously, I mean, we try and, as architects, because, uh, we try, we're trying we, to get we, ahead of the eight house ball, that I, um, I find with houses sometimes, it's actually quite a lot of small parts to put together. Uh, unlike unlike uh, a new build of a large structure, for example, um, how, how how do you find that process for you? Um, I was going to say stressful, but it ha I must be honest, it wasn't stressful. We 
we were so fortunate to have an amazing builder on the first property. He's yeah. now buggered off to Ireland, sadly. Um, but I've now found another as good a builder. Um, and I think that is a huge part of it that we, um, we rely so much. We, we're not the people who are building the building. We're not the people putting bricks onto bricks and doing yeah. things anymore. I mean, you think back, old Izzy Benjamin always used to talk about um, how he would go to site and he would be doing all the mosaics and casting things and doing stuff on site. I think it's just changed so much over the years. But I think yeah. it's so important to find a builder that you can have a relationship with. Um, and I think what helped there too was that he was he was quite relaxed, um, as was my client. We never really needed to get too hot and heavy in terms of contracts and things. We just it was it was tight when it needed to be tight but yeah. the builder also understood that there are complexities that come with dealing with an existing structure so I, there may not have been a drawing or a, or a detail done for a particular space but we would then just deal with it on site and he would i think the sign of a good builder is when you are asking them to do something they just go ahead and do it or they improve it and they provide solutions. I think a huge red flag is when you're talking and then it's just the excuse, the excuse wagon gets rolled out yeah. and it's going to be this and it's going to be an extra and it's going to be that, that, and the next yeah. thing. Um, if you've got someone who is kind of invested as well, it just made it easier. So yeah, I, for me, it was, it was the builder. The builder was amazing. Um, we dealt with things on site very quickly site instructions. Um, I think a lot of old buildings, you end up doing that. And I learned that was a lesson I learned from, from Dean, um, working on line match. You just, you just didn't have the time to go back to your desk and redraw stuff. The, the, the construction process was happening so quickly and that was commercial. So it was happening very fast sites instructions, just books of site instructions, quick little sketches approved by the client, approved by the contractor, go done next thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Cameron. Um, colleagues, um, if you want to have a chat with Cameron, uh, this is your chance. You can come through. Skura, can I butt in? Thanks. Ben, come through. Yeah. From, from, the, from the distant north, uh, from Belita. Uh, Cameron, thank you very I much. Can. Absolutely fascinating. Thanks very much. Um, I'm thank a relatively you. new boy in the area, so I was not even aware of Beset, but thank you. Um, is Beset up and running uh, with your 250 people walks at this stage? I... <laughs> no, no, we haven't. The last one we did was just before um, lockdown. Okay. I think it was actually in uh, early days. We've done a couple of small walks um, last year and this year. Those have been very small, kind of just testing the grounds. I mean, it's, it's only really been in the last couple of months that people have felt um, okay with being outside without a mask on and being around crowds. Um, we also are very aware of people feeling nervous about hanging out, but we definitely want to get back into the swing of things. Um, sure. Well, there's nothing sure, like it, being actually there. So yeah. well done. Terrific. Fantastic. But tell me how, I mean, do you come up against any problems with officialdom? You okay there? Um, the, uh, the, the municipality the seem of... to have helped you a bit. But you don't have any yeah. instructions from anybody else to you, I hope. Um, Please, that sort of thing. Not, not, not really, not really. To be honest, it's been a we've kind of run on the the principle of um, asking for forgiveness than permission. Yeah. Um, but obviously, without breaking any rules and laws, we've we've had people like Eric Applegren, who's um, opened the city hall for us, for example. We managed to go up into where they used to practice um, ballet up in the the dome in the Globe. Um, so we've lent on people a lot. We've also, um, we did a walk at the, the old whaling station and that took about a year of kind of red tape. And my, my buddy Jonas is amazing at getting results from people and he just stuck with it for about a year. It took us about a year to do that. That's been the most um, requested repeat walk is to go and do the, the um, whaling station have, again. Have you, thought, a um, Cameron, have you thought about actually uh, videoing any of this, recording any of it? And putting it out. Thank you for the, bringing that the up. Airwaves. What, one, one of my, I mean, one of the guys. people is terrific, but what about the rest of the blooming public? 
<laughs> one, of, one of the guys is actually a videographer and we're always saying to him like, come on, man, you need to set this thing up and, and video. But he did and was at the time. Um, we do have, if you, if you go onto our Instagram page, we've got highlight reels of where we've just done very basic videos as we went. Um, again, that was a, um, a bright spark idea from Jonah. So we, we do have some record of the later walks. Um, so yeah, if you go into our Instagram across the top, the highlights, you can literally rewatch parts of the walk, but not, not any high production stuff. Now, the other thing, Cameron, that I think is really missing from our part of the world, certainly from uh, KZN Durban area, as well as the rest of the country, is something like ADA. Do you know about the ADA magazines that were produced by Ginny Sorrell uh, between it rings a I bell. Think 70, 86 and 96? It's getting out unusual things to do with the built environment. And, uh, you know, I'm not sort of trying to point at you, but it just, it just seems <laughs> to me that the younger group need to get themselves together and produce a publication. I mean, Jenny Sorrell was an amazing woman. Um, and if you've seen any of the ADA mags, that's what I think we need right now to stimulate something. We've all got into a little bit of a comfort zone. We all become, I'm afraid, a little bit too conservative in this country. Um, and it's time that I think that all sorts of ideas were there, not just to stir the architectural profession, but to stir the general public. And the architects are far too shy about getting involved with the media in this country. I'm not quite sure why. Um, I'm from Zim, and certainly um, during the, uh, the good times, the 80s and the early 90s in Zim, there was a lot of communication with the press as well, and the television. You know, we just got to think a little bit out of the box. Anyway, that's the one thing. The other thing is, if I could just add, I'm fascinated with your repurpose, retrofit, um, reuse um, approach and aspect. Have you had, has there been any significant official response to this process? There is a significant number of old building stock in Durban that is just sitting there doing nothing apart from storing furniture or some bloody thing. Um, and we have a massive housing problem in our part of the world, an enormous problem for low income people. Um, have you been involved at all in um, any official contact? Uh, I mean, the other thing that, that I find fascinating is that we have so little emphasis on self-help, self-build as well, um, that I think architects need to get much more involved in. But what about official response to repurpose, rebuild? Any, any response on your side, any thoughts on your side, how to get the message across more clearly? Um, Some of it has happened. Yeah, I it mean, the, it's, it's to, to answer your first question just about publications and things, I, I totally agree with you, Ken. I think um, we looked at it. I know um, when uh, George Georgie was involved in the Institute, she was looking at doing a publication called Spilt Milk. Um, Skura, I think you were involved in that thing too. Um, uh, that, no, I wasn't. I wasn't there. Were you not involved? Mm -mm, no. I mean, I is there involved. any way you can get a juicy beefed up to yeah. be more graphic, more, you know, or is, is we? I mean, they, they, they come out and they're sort of stimulating little papers, but they're little papers. Yeah, there were something there, that is, there were so that is many... geared towards the graphics, <clears throat> the physical. Yeah, there were so many. I also recall um, when I was at Design Workshop, there were things like Casco Land. I don't know if you ever heard of that. There was like a whole experience through the city and it was like a big carnival and ended up being a um uh, a big event at the end of the day and that was quite nice being a physical thing but i don't know i mean i think if you speak to most people they think paper is dead and it's all digital nowadays but but i'm, I'm i read books and i like physical things well, so i, I don't like know. to hold a book in my hand you're quite right yeah. or a magazine um, anyway, and then to answer your second question, point. I haven't had any direct input um, or official input from from any city city officials or anything. I obviously would be um, keen to to get involved in that way. Um, obviously, I mean the the big the big thing for me, and I, I don't want to open up a can of worms. Um, I might just open it a touch, but it's um, uh, I've been dealing with a Marfa now for the past could feel like the energy changed in the digital world when I mentioned them after. Um, they, yeah, been dealing with them for the past 10, 15 years. And 
I found it's been quite tricky, let's say. I'll put it at that. So I think first, first thing we need to resolve is submission processes and things because people are just not interested. When I when when I've speak to clients like good guys and I say, look, we're in you're in for six months. The building is is protected by a MAFO. If it's older than six sixty years, you you just add six months to the time and then you, we, we, you know, I think a lot of, I think, I, I think a lot of architects have lost projects because of things like that. And they just, clients will do their own thing. I mean, you only have to take a walk around places like Morningside and Musgrave and to, to see that, yeah, it's not, it's not necessarily being upheld. So I don't know where the, <laughs> John has said six months is lucky. Exactly. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. Skura, you can answer that question. I've got no swing on my side. Yeah. So the, it's in two parts. One, 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 one of the part is uh, whether we can engage the city in repurposing uh, buildings uh, for, for 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 residential. Um, and funny enough, the, the somebody uh, whom from the city was going to be talking the next private papers. So it's along other things, but uh, we can include that as well. But uh, with uh, with Amafa, we've we've had camera. I don't know if, if you you seen the communication. We've we've met Amafa. I think last year or the year before twice, eh? uh, because we are trying to get to the bottom of this whole situation of you submitting and never hearing uh, back from them. Uh, currently, uh, you are at least likely to hear from them that well we've received your 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 your, 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 your submission within three weeks yeah uh, you are likely to hear that now but then uh, it just means that <clears throat> from that onwards you know that it's something that's 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 on hand for that, that they are continuing to work uh, on it uh, they, they've been having a uh, different uh, uh, the success of what they are doing is varied with project by project. Some they will come back to you. Uh, in, in some projects, uh, there's more complications, uh, you know, and so forth. Uh, but in a situation where a project uh, takes longer than than six months, Kim is in touch with Amafa, the, the office, and we've we've been, we've, been, we've managed to actually help quite quite a number of people. Where, exactly. where we really see that the, the, the time is getting really, really unreasonable and it, and it is actually uh, getting out of hand. Uh, we are able to do that. Uh, Lindsay is coming here to rescue me now <laughs> with some of the answers. <laughs> but uh, Cameron, our, our relationship with, with Amafa, I, I, feel, I feel is in a, in, in, in a place where we can actually address quite a lot of things. So if there's a particular project that 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 that, that, that anybody feels that is actually just get, tracking on and on and on, uh, it's something that we definitely can can come in to assist. Yeah, uh, Lindsay. Thanks, Kira. I don't know if I'll rescue you, but I'll try. You <laughs> <laughs> um, know, just on a bit of positive and negative. The positives are that they they have improved in their timeframes. So that is good, and they are pushing their their meetings and their processing times. Um, but what I want to encourage members to to get involved in are uh, we had an invitation last week last year to attend a workshop on Florida Road on the Florida Road precinct and discussing development parameters on it, and it was very clear in that discussion and there were quite a few members online um, it was very clear that there's a lack of understanding in the MAFA um, of design principles um, and they are following a rule book so we have to come in and assist or push that they get an architect on their panel because we're going to be up against this all the time otherwise um, so that's the problem it's, it's a much more complex problem than just timeframes. Um, so uh, well done, Cameron, for, for uh, demonstrating that you can reuse these old buildings in a modern way. And um, now we've just got to convince Amafa that it's acceptable. 
Yeah. 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 And look, I, I've just I've just seen um, Ros Harbors. Uh, I was just about to say this that um, Amafa can't be blamed entirely. It it isn't just at their doorstep. I think we we as an architectural um, as as an industry need to almost re-educate people on it. You don't have to destroy to make things beautiful. I, I actually believe you can make things more beautiful if, if you've got good bones, like I've been talking about to start with, obviously if something is horrendous and it's, yeah, it's tricky, then fair enough. But, um, I think a big, a big part of it is also coming from us and it isn't the easy way out. The easy way out is to level the site and start from scratch. Cause then you've got control over everything. I mean, yeah. there's yet to be a project that I, I feel like I'm ahead of the eight ball, um, to paraphrase Dean, um, you just, it, it's so difficult because there's always skeletons in the closet. You open up a ceiling panel and something else is different and it's very, yeah, it probably doesn't make economic sense either for architects. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm going to carry on doing it. Thanks. Thanks, Vinny. I, I think the one thing that we've noticed when, when we deal with that individual submission one by one, when somebody says, look, man, this has been going on for months is that you actually realize there's no, the, the reason for the delay is actually not the, the same with, with everything. Yes, uh, Amafa has to have, have to try and find out how they can be able to em employ a registered architect. Um, there are regulations at the moment don't allow them. Avert Lindsay. Uh, uh, pardon? Avert Lindsay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to say so, formally. Yeah, but in, in, in some respects, like uh, like um, like Rose uh, has been saying, you actually find that the the information as asking I'm asking for information from the architect also uh, adds to the delay. Uh, so it actually is never what what, what causes the delay is not always uh, the, the the same thing uh, that is maybe I'm for inefficient whatnot whatnot. So which is why as the institute we want to assist with that. And we want to take uh, each, each case on its merit. Uh, don't necessarily want to uh, 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 change your, your talk into a heritage workshop. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it does. It's, it's very, it's very important things. Yeah. Um, any other, any other comment question? Uh, so Cameron, um, in, in, in me working with urban renewal projects, parks and stuff. Uh, and then I have, I work with, let's say Lucas Ace or some other landscape architects. I find that I learned so much from them uh, that uh, I did not know as an architect. I mean, not even just plants, uh, but just uh, principle, principles of design outside uh, the, 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 the building. Uh, how has working with your partner, who is an interior designer, enriched you? Because as architects, you always think that you know everything. Have you felt that architects don't have the softer side of things uh, as compared to, let's say, a, an interior designer? How you how, how you found that? Yeah, she. Uh, Rob, I've she, noted you. Uh, you come in after Cameron. Um, Jess has taught me loads, not just about design and interiors and all that, but also just how to deal with people. Like she's amazing with people. Um, I recall her, um, she, she was brought in to do the interiors for JT Ross when, when I was working at Dean's, um, she came in and she did a presentation. It was quite a big deal that loads of the JT Ross partners were there and Dean and all of us and Jess was presenting and she just, she just had this ability to command the room and the way that she spoke. And I remember, I never forget. I remember Dean saying like, I wish I could talk like that to my client and get them like, say it how it is, you know, and the, the, you know, the, I think um, one of them, I think it was uh, Doug said, you know, Oh, you know, don't want to do it that color. Can we do it this color? And she was like, no, we're not doing that. And he was like, sat back in his chair and was like, Oh, okay. And he's like, I wish I could speak like that to people. She, she, she's the expert. She's the expert. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what it is. I suppose we do have to, it, it's a thin edge. I mean, we've, we've always got to, um, we have to be in control and whatnot. But she, yeah, she's, she's been amazing. So just from that aspect, from a social perspective, she's, she's helped me massively. Um, I'm 
quite short tempered um scottish heritage so she's sort of just tried to you know don't don't point out all the bad things all the time all the time it's just sort of cruise with it a little bit um but yeah i mean in terms of interiors i think that's a huge thing is that whoever you are dealing with that's not just necessarily jess but um if you've got a I, f- I find if you've got a curiosity to learn and not necessarily be subservient but uh, you know if you're going into a shop fitters we don't know how all those machines work you might do um mm. but tr- just try and learn and understand and talk the same language and and you know, massage egos and stuff and, and, and leave yours at the door, I often find you end up, um, you end up with a way better product. Well, I've found that anyway, the way that I've kind of been dealing with people and that a lot of that has come from, from Jess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. But it's learning. Eh? If you, if you mm. are interested in learning how to do things, um, and our professional, um, relationship is awesome. It's, we agree on far more things in a, in a professional, professional capacity than we do in a personal capacity, which is, which is great. So I'm hoping to work with her more and more. I mean, we've both growing our team this year, we've got staff now with us. So yeah, we're hoping to do some more work together. I see. She's on the just, log, by the way, on the call. No, no, she's not. She's not. I said she should listen in cause she was going to be mentioned a few times, but um, I see Anta yeah, said maybe. Because- to uh, do the breakfast talk. <laughs> somebody just said that what if she does uh, yeah it's and yeah so she doesn't and leave under the shadow of i'll leave on. i'll leave that to you you can you can have a conversation. <laughs> okay uh rob Rousseau? how's it rob okay uh, thanks very much for this really nice talk it's so refreshing to hear a human being talk with the humility <laughs> and honesty that you have um and i really appreciate it just slightly a curve ball. Looking back at your experiences, did you have to do practical work during the holidays when you were at university, or were you already outside that um, requirement? No, we did. We did. Um, yeah, after first year, there was a gap. Um, I'm trying to think where I was. I think I oh, I did a I did a month's worth of work experience with um, Basil Vogus. Um, who I think has since left okay. to Australia. And then in second year was with um, EPA. So yeah, I did definitely did some during um, studies. My main question is that uh, you've now been in practice for several years as well. Um, you've worked for a number of firms. How important would you say is the practical experience that one gains um, at, throughout one's uh, academic uh, experience and then immediately after um, with reference to an apprenticeship it's all very well going through the academic course you come out and you think you know everything how what what comment have you got on that <laughs> it's absolutely critical i wouldn't have been able to branch out on my own if i if i hadn't had those experiences um yeah it's i don't think many people can i mean like I said, when I, when I finished my undergrad, um, you don't really know anything. And that's why I said I, I managed to convince Design Workshop to take me on. Um, that was a huge learning curve for me. Um, just seeing how, I mean, that was my first real um, step into the real world, really. And, and again, like you say, Rob, you, you, you finish university um, degrees, you think you know everything, and then you go to site and you don't know what half the things are that the contract is speaking to you about. I mean, it's all, it's all absolutely relevant. And then traveling was fantastic, had loads of ideas, went back knowing I was going to be a student. So I read a lot while I was, while I was working. Um, I, I think I had about a three hour commute for a year, an hour and a half there, hour and a half back. And I read so many books preparing to be a student again. Um, it was quite nice to branch those two things together um and then finished and uh finished my postgrad and then yeah like i said i literally got thrown in the deep end with dean um you know within the first couple of months i was running meetings with 12 other people and just getting absolutely hammered constantly because you know as a people pleaser you're trying to just deal with everything and yeah it was it was 
hectic, but massive, massive learning curve. I mean, I could never have started my own business without the training I had from Dean. No way. And I mean, like Skura said, there's so many people that have trained under Dean have now gone on to open their own practice and, and, and kind of branch out. I don't know how many um, people are being able to do that. I mean, yeah, huge respect with Dean. I still have a great relationship with him um, and very, very gracious for the opportunities he gave me. Because I think a lot of times people are, you know, especially in undergrad, you're thrown in to do drainage sections for a year. And then maybe if you get a chance, you can design a door schedule or maybe just like one door. Um, Dean's practice was very much everybody was doing everything all the time. Yeah, it's very, very open and trusting, which is, is yeah, it was great. So critical would be my response in short, Rob. Even let you play ping pong in his office. Yeah, only after hours. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think he knew about that. Thanks, Gura. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he knew that we were playing ping pong. <laughs> I know everything. Thanks, thanks Cameron. Um, I would, thanks, Rob. I would like to hope that this message might get through to um, our Regcom and that we start trying to uh, encourage the university to take up this during the academic year and that um, we encourage younger architects that there is a great value to be gained from learning in offices before you start inflicting yourself upon society. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. Good point, Rob. Good point. Noted. Um, any more questions? Any questions, comments? I think that was clear and very, very uh, great uh, to listen to. Uh, Cameron, it's a good way to start a Friday. Thank you, cool, thank thanks, you, thank you so much, man, and uh, all the best for your practice. Um, uh, unfortunately, we as architects, we learn the hard way that uh, it is a business. You know, uh, it's not just a great design, but it's actually it's a business that you're running. So thanks, thanks so much. Uh, your parting shot. Um. Yeah, just huge thanks to everybody. I know time is time is money now, as they say, um, and I really appreciate you coming on to spend an hour or so with us. Um, yeah, so thank you and good luck out there. Yeah, lovely. Um, one yeah, announcement, uh, colleague, is that uh, just look out for the the next practice breakfast. So we, we, we had these during uh, COVID. Uh, it was much better doing them like this, that will continue like this because you essentially come from your place and just uh, for, from your room and, and set up it's without driving. But it, it's also good to, if, if it's open like this, to have in person where we can. The next one we'll have is a, a guy from the city, uh, Eric Applegren. Uh, we have been trying to work uh, with a number of things with the city, which uh, we've battled to uh, take off the ground, like the floods, how we can be involved in all those things. And he would really love to come and share the vision of the city and how the city can collaborate with architects. And that will be in person at the Institute uh, in February, but it will be hybrid. So uh, if you want to come, come through, but also it will be, uh, be on the online like this. So going forward, we'll try and go back to, to, to hybrid situations like that in person as well. Uh, but these are, I find quite uh, uh, um, um, what's this, comfortable because you are just at a, in your home. So look out for that for the, for the next one um, so that we as architects uh, strive to make a meaningful uh, contribution to the city, hence that the question of housing in the inner city uh, is something that um, we can discuss there as well. But thanks so much, uh, Fini, and uh, may everyone may have a great um, weekend. Thank you for logging in. Thanks, Tom. Thank thanks, you. guys. Thanks, Ruben. Shots, Gore. Thanks for the opportunity, man. Appreciate it. Cheers, bro. Cheers, bro. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Cheers, Mark. Thanks.
Thanks, Cam. That was great. Love hey, you. Hey, Anina. Thanks. So enjoyed that. Okay. Cheers. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs>